All right, it's three minutes past, so I think maybe we should make a start. Um, hi, everyone that's joined. Welcome to this FCI webinar. Um, I'm just going to give a few housekeeping things that are being shown on the screen at the moment, and then I'll pass over to Abraham, who's chairing. Um, as you can see, we're going to we're going to mute all um, all attendees, and if you could please stay muted until the Q and A section, then we'll ask you to uh, ask a question. Um, there's some shortcuts here for Windows and Mac for toggling um, mute. Um, and you can also do it in this um, in this panel bar here. Um, if you could ask any questions throughout the um, presentation uh, in the in the chat function um, using the conversation bar, which is circled here, and then we can pick them out at the end. Um, and we're also recording at the moment, and it's going to be uploaded to the faculty site and YouTube channel. Um, so I hope you're all, all right with that. And um, yeah, I'll pass on to Abraham if that's all right. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Joe mentioned, I'm Abraham George. I'm a public at uh, Kent County Council. I've been working as a consultant for, or uh, it's going to be 10 years now uh, in Kent, and I've been particularly leading on uh, around the use of data and information for public health intelligence. And today I have the privilege of inviting my fellow senior colleagues across uh, Kent and Medway who have been working with for many years in building up the key infrastructure, leadership and capacity for analytics across our system in Kenton Medway. Uh, Kenton Medway is not as maybe a, a, a small borough. It's actually a population of almost 1.8, 1.9 million uh, po population and covering uh, 200 uh, spread across multiple organizations, 200 and at least 220 GP practices. Uh, seven NHS provider trusts and two uh, councils. Uh, so very, very complex uh, landscape that we work in in, in Kenton Medway. Uh, but like most other local economies, we uh, we as uh, fellow colleagues have had to come out of our own organizational footprints and collaborate and work together as a system uh, around analytics. And, and there are so many issues that we needed to get sorted out to actually enable a place-based place approach to analytics, such as sorting out governance arrangements, information governance uh, 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 framework and process and procedures, uh, negotiating and uh, systematizing the data flows for linking data, appreciation and, and the application of different advanced and applied analytical approaches for which we've got uh, two exciting presentations that are being delivered by fellow colleagues. Next slide, please. Sorry, next slide. Sorry, I think I might be one second. Is that coming up or is it still? It's still the first one. Is that moving along or no? Hmm. Uh, that's fine, Joe. I mean, uh, try and uh, when you can just send, uh, go into the next slide. I'll I'll carry on. So basically, I have the pleasure for for today's webinar. I have the pleasure of introducing five presentations. We'll be talking about first around the linked data set development uh, that we've been doing across Kenton Medway for for almost seven years. Now, uh, it started with a linked data set development, a uh, linked data set called the Kent Integrated Data Set that was originally started by Public Health, but we've been working with various other colleagues in developing it. But uh, most of the uh, discussion will be around uh, the, the development of our new ambition for a, for a new linked data set, which will encompass various uh, kinds of functionalities. And we're calling that the kernel. And that will be presented by Mark uh, from East Kent Hospitals Trust, uh, followed by a presentation on how we're going to be using data for applied research. And this is part of a regional program that's uh, that's being led by University of Kent. And we have the pleasure of uh, uh, Chris Farmer to present on that. And I will be coming back uh, to the third presentation. I'll be presenting some specifically around some of the IG uh, arrangements with that we've done, particularly around joint data controller. And I'll be presenting that on behalf of our IG uh, secure, uh, sort of information security lead across Kent Menu, that's Alan Day. And then followed by uh, a specific use of some of our advanced analytics uh, by one of our fellow consultant in public health based at Medway Council, and that's David, uh, and how he's had 
how's it been able to socialize and promote the use of uh, R-based approach for an analysis. And finally, Peter Lacey from Whole Systems Partnership is going to talk about how he's been using modeling and simulation to support our local response to uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So without much further ado, I'll pass it over to Mark and he can start talking about the uh, kernel and, uh, and the kid as well. Thank you. Thanks, Abraham. Thanks, Jerry. I'll just give you a nod for each slide if that's all right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, the, the background to this is a kind of history of linked data sets, which um, Adrian, uh, sorry, Adrian, Abraham has been very involved in over the last few years. And the, the sort of simple premise was that with quite a sort of clean geography in, in the sense that we're surrounded by the sea and most of our re-emissions come to our hospitals um, and good relationships between people who have tended to stay in this sector and this region for quite a long time. We've had a history of linking data. So very simply, uh, here's, a, here's a record of me coming into a GP. Here's one a week later of me going to an A&E. Um, here's one a month later of me being seen by someone in the community um, and then potentially being scooped up by an ambulance and so on. And when you link data across those different sectors, it becomes really powerful. And it's very easy to describe, but it's it's generally not done well. And the kid that Abraham was kind of integral to has been held up as a kind of leading example of that um, and been used nationally quite a lot. So uh, as, you, as people would imagine on this call, there's there's big kind of funding discussions that go on centrally and how you apportion money through the Treasury down through NHS England. And those try and take into account as best they can the populations that those people that are being served locally. Um, doing it nationally is fine, but actually having local data to calibrate it is really, really powerful. And there's a kind of good analogy there with a lot of the COVID work that's gone on. So we had a lot of press early on around national models coming out of London. Um, when we actually started building our modelling locally, and Peter will probably talk about some of this, we just found that local expertise and local data meant that those models were much more accurate and much more useful operationally. So we've had a we've had a history of linking data in the region, and I think it'd be fair to say that historically it was done using relatively what I might pejoratively call kind of administrative data. So from from where I and Chris work as a hospital, you would get data on the day I came in, the day I left the ICD-10 code for diagnoses, the OPCS code for procedures. Um, you might get return to theatre. Um, you wouldn't get that very detailed clinical data about the cut to close rate within theatre or the creatine score for the patient or regular uh, blood pressure checks or anything like that. And what we're trying to do from moving from the kid to the kernel is to go kind of in depth and breadth and I'll, I'll explain that in a slide in a moment. The other key point, if you just go to the next slide, Joe, thank you, is historically this type of linked data has just been used for research um, and we intend to absolutely continue to do that and to do even more research and link in with the medical school, um, take advantage of new approaches coming like natural language processing and machine learning and so on. But what we also want to do is to actually use this data each day, potentially each minute even. And this, this diagram here is an attempt at explaining the ambition for that. So I work in a busy hospital um, and it's important for me to know live how many people are waiting in our emergency department, how many of them have had a swab for COVID, how many of them are waiting for an x-ray to come back, how many of them we think we will need to create a bed for, and so on. So I kind of need operational data um, live. I need to know if I need to have a conversation with the ambulance service about not bringing any ambulances to us for two hours to let our AED calm down a little bit. So there's kind of an operational use of data. Uh, we then, we're doing a lot of planning work as well, which I think is, is quite helpful from this linked data sets point of view. And that would be um, things we're doing at the moment. You know, we've got very ambitious plans about seeing a lot of our outpatients virtually and digitally. Well, some people, because of their age and social class or ethnicity or lifestyle characteristics, might insist on coming into the hospital to see Chris as a renal outpatient. Um, others might be very relaxed about that and find it much more convenient. So we can plan services much better. Um, and then stepping up into 
strategic capabilities for this data. Um, we've been working for the last couple of years on whether we might centralise some of our stroke services. So would we have a thrombectomy centre, um, one or two across Kent? Would we offer thrombolysis services as satellites around that? Where would we put them? Um, how long does it take the ambulance to drive from point A to that new thrombectomy centre and so on? And you need historical linked data uh, with mapping capability, the ability to analyse by um, comorbidities and Charleston scores and ethnicity and, and so on uh, to do that type of work. And then right through into the kind of traditional use of linked data set, which would be research. And we put a, a I just put an example in there from talking to a midwife, some kind of social marketing um, angles to quite a lot of this. They There's a sort of perceived issue in Kent that a lot of women would be slightly embarrassed about their pelvic floor, um, aren't going to Zumba anymore. And could we could we do some kind of proactive public health with certain people just to just to try and stave off um, issues that may occur for them uh, and a whole a whole range of examples around that. So uh, one key point I wanted to make on this call to advertise that through very good joint working, we've linked in with the police to link their data to ours to analyse intimate partner violence. And you, you'll have seen people on this call domestic abuse being reported during lockdown and there's kind of a uh, high number of calls and, you know, people just anecdotally worried about that. And, and information governance wise, that's quite quite difficult. Um, but I think we've been quite bullish locally and said, well, you know, we think we're on the side of the angels and this is really important work. So we're going to try and convince everyone that it's the right thing to do. Um, if you could just skip on to slide five, Joe. <clears throat> so uh, background in the kid, linking administrative data. And if you look at this diagram, I think what we've done over the last sort of five or 10 years is, is link across the top of that diagram, um, but at a, at a relatively thin level. So for acute data, when they came in, when they went home, what we did to them without the creatinine score and the metadata for the X-ray and so on. The aim, so that's our breadth, if you like. And then what we're planning with the kernel and we hope that in a sort of model of build it and they will come, we will create a huge linked clinical data set. If you come down the left, um, is a is an ever increasing level of richness to the data. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So we would have early warning score data in there. Every four hours or so, we would visit most patients at their bed and check how they're doing, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, and a variety of other measures, and come up with an acuity score for them. That would enable us to say if some of them didn't need to be in an acute setting anymore, could be could be managed in the community, for example. Uh, we've got maternity data on there, so very, very detailed data about the type of labour that the, the, the mother and baby kind of went through. Um, <clears throat> EPR data, it's not going to be long before we've, we're holding an awful lot of text about patients that is ripe for natural language processing. So we're doing some work at the moment looking at how different doctors and nurses write down um, rib fracture because they all write it down in different ways and if an elderly frail patient can't reach to press the button to get the morphine we need to analyze electronically the data that is being recorded about them so that we can send alerts around so you kind of i think what we're seeing is a kind of move from traditional kind of population profiling jsna type analysis right through to the kind of use of of ai and and sort of predictive techniques for you know when a patient might deteriorate uh, which patients are might become a greater risk of readmissions around COVID? Um, are there certain types of people more likely to get post-viral fatigue than others? And you need that kind of cl clinical level of data beyond the administrative. I'll just take one more slide, Joe, and then I'll hand back to Abraham. Thank you. Um, this is just an example to illustrate the different types of work that different types of people do. So there's a lot of kind of health professionals in the region and historically, we would tend to kind of work in our silos a little bit. What we're trying to encourage with the kernel is a much, uh, much more kind of egalitarian and um, just seeing each other more often and, and building pieces of work together. So a good example of that, as I've tried to put on here, would be demand and capacity modelling coming out of COVID. So what of our elective work would we want to try and push to the independent sector? If we were thinking of building a field hospital at Dertling, would we put, try and put all our COVID patients in there so we could 
get our hospitals COVID clean or would we do it the other way around? Um, there's, there's big strategic pieces of work that we would like to do more collaboratively and we hope that the kernel is kind of an underpinning for that. Um, Abraham, I'll stop there just because I'm, I'm almost up for time and I'm happy to take questions um, in the discussion or, or whenever. That's fine. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll crack on anyway, and we can we can talk about quest, uh, talk questions at the end of the session. Uh, in the meantime, we'll uh, we'll we'll carry on with uh, Professor Chris Farmer from East Kent Hospitals as well, and he'll talk about the research, uh, the applied research angle for uh, and how we are using linked data for that. Chris. Hi. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Great. Um, so I, I'm a, a practicing clinician, a renal physician at East Kent Hospitals, but also academic at the University of Kent. And over the last few years, uh, we've been working very hard to try and uh, provide uh, linked data sets for the more traditional research, that kind of research that requires research ethics and, and getting uh, data sets to people to, 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 to do advanced analytics such as predictive modeling using AI or other uh, population based research. Um, I'm going to talk today a bit about uh, the applied research collaboration, uh, which is across Kent, Surrey, Sussex. Um, you'll see from a later slide, I'm not a key member of the research collaboration, but it's, it's hosted or the director is hosted within the department in which I work. And there is a key digital uh, work stream uh, across um, uh, the, the, the whole uh, collaboration uh, to which the kernel and our linked data set is going to be a key uh, part of. Could I have the next slide? Thanks. So the uh, applied research uh, collaboration is, is directed by Stephen Peckham, who works at uh, the Centre for Health Services Studies at the University of Kent. Um, just to, to let you know that um, there is a fund, potential funding available against this if people have uh, potential projects uh, relevant to the research themes which I'm coming on to in the next slide, please. So the Applied Research Consortiums um, uh, have taken place, uh, 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 taken over from the Clarks, which was the collaboration for leadership in applied health research and care. Um, the ARCs now cover every region in England and they all have different themes. Um, I'm not going to list the themes for each of the other regions, but if I could have the next slide, please. So the idea is that they uh, develop regionally based uh, partnerships. Uh, but importantly, between NHS services, local authorities, health and social care and universities and other NIHR bodies. And as Mark said in his previous slides, that's what we are trying to replicate, if you like, by uh, linking data, uh, which isn't always um, the kind of stuff that, that is available across, across large networks. And my particular interest is is very granular data such as as um, uh, patient security in hospital and predictive modelling. Um, the overall aim is to improve health and social care uh, for people through applied research into practice. So again, it's it's using this data uh, to to uh, alter practice in a relatively short time frame. If I could have the next slide. So um, the core activities of, of the KSS ARC are looking at capacity building in health and social care, so sustainable workforce, a good academic, clinical and academic environment, um, uh, applied health and social care research, so uh, core research themes and, and projects um, with an aim of increasing research capacity and funding. And there's a very large public and patient uh, involvement piece within the ARC, which is obviously absolutely key uh, to getting uh, public buy-in for, for such a linked uh, data set. If I could have the next slide. Um, these are the key people in the team. I've put this up really to show that we've got 
a number of, of themes, so social care, starting well, dementia, primary and community care, but across those uh, are uh, an, a number of, of streams such as co-production, public health, and for the purposes of this digital in innovation, uh, which is uh, led by Joe Arms at the University of Surrey, who has a background in uh, in uh, inform informatics applications in healthcare, particularly uh, in the cancer setting. If I could have the next slide. So the whole thing is much broader than this. This is one of uh, my doodlings, which has been much altered. But uh, I think the, the point about this is that on the left hand side, uh, we're looking at a very broad uh, range of, of uh, data sets coming into the kernel and uh, hopefully uh, enveloping all of the benefits that the Kent Inform in integrated data set had before. We're looking at uh, getting a data set of people who've opted into research, which would then lead to improving uh, recruitment into NIHR portfolio studies. Um, but across the top, health planning and, and uh, PANC and audits, quality improvement programs can all be driven by this data set. And on the right hand side, we're really looking at academies, SMEs, um, the, the local institute of directors, all buying into to our data program. Uh, and next slide, please. We've got a few current programs and I apologise, I've put the ones that I'm mainly involved in, but we're looking at survival and dialysis patients. Uh, pregnancy and renal disease. There's a national study on the deteriorating patient in hospital, which we actually did uh, before the, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, it will be fascinating to, to repeat that uh, in future months and may give us some real insights into how to best manage uh, this population. Uh, there's a, a, a programme looking at cancer prediction in lung cancer. Um, autism and health and law, ethics and cyber security. So I'm pretty much out of time. I'll stop there and uh, happy to take questions. Um, uh, there's one about GP input. Um, uh, I, shall I leave that to the end, Abraham? I can certainly say there's a huge amount of GP input. Yeah, I think we'll, uh, if Joe is happy, we'll we'll keep all the questions uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the talk, and uh, after we finish with uh, myself, uh, David, and Peter. But thank you very much, uh, Chris, for for presenting uh -huh. that. And um, I think it's just uh, demonstrating how complex the whole research agenda is, and then collaborating with various other organizations, organizations even beyond Kent and Medway, um, and and the fact that. Uh, the uh, market already uh, presented uh, a very, very high level snapshot of the development of the kernel linked data set. As you know, we'll in, it involves the curation of hundreds of data sets across uh, multiple organizations across Kent and Medway. So bringing the data together in, is one thing, but uh, and then aligning the, uh, the research agenda aims and objectives is another. And now we're coming into the the uh, the bugbear that most of us actually uh, find uh, quite annoying or probably a, a real challenge and frust a frustration at times, uh, which is actually how do we actually sort out the governance and the information governance arrangements for actually um, curating the necessary data, accessing it in, in at time at pace and scale, uh, making it available to the right uh, to the right research teams or analytical teams to actually then generate meaningful outputs for uh, that will influence decision making both at service delivery as well as at a policy level. So uh, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail of all the things that we did over the many years, but um, it's it the I think the the most important exciting that we've done in the last uh, year or so was actually promoting the concept and actually implementing the uh, the joint data controller arrangements which are actually uh, which was actually a, a sort of a brainchild of our uh, corporation information security officer at Kent County Council who also works at a Kent and Medway system level uh, his name is Alan Days uh, next slide please so uh, this is a very tongue-in-cheek explanation of of the challenges that we have which is the fact that 
we've got all these multiple data sets all uh, controlled, for a lack of a better way, controlled by multiple organizations within a system. How do you create the, the wicked issue is how do you actually create a, a systematic process at a system level to actually make all of these uh, combined data sets uh, available for for health analytics? Uh, particularly that the fact that it's not just one analytical team sitting in one organization accessing, but it's multiple teams having a access to that data at different levels. So this is a particular challenge around that. And the and, and fortunately, the the uh, uh, GDPR or general data protection regulations affords that opportunity, which is I think uh, in one of the articles uh, mentioned, uh, which I'll come into uh, very shortly. Next slide, please. So uh, Article 26, that's the one which actually uh, basically states that if you jointly decide the purpose and the means, then uh, two or more data controllers can actually come together uh, as long as to as long as they're following the same set of processes and procedures and they can uh, they can bring their data sets together to uh, jointly decide the purposes of what they can uh, that data set can be used for. So uh, as long and then the important thing is that th those processes and procedures are as transparent as possible and the uh, respective controllers as well as the data processor. So for us, for us, we have at least two or three data warehouse teams in in Kent and Medi were actually processing linked data for us. They they collectively meet their obligations and, and follow the necessary compliance arrangements. So we have a, uh, a set of paperwork that describes the statement of joint control, the necessary uh, model clauses, and uh, very importantly, we have a data protection impact assessment, which is the first most important thing that you have to do before you do any sort of data sharing project. And, and fortunately, we've, we preempted the importance of getting uh, not just uh, internal, but also external legal opinion to, to ensure the uh, robustness and the confidence of, of our uh, risk assessment around data sharing. Next slide, please. Uh, so what, we've, uh, what we're developing now is a controlled environment for analytics. And we have the governance arrangement, which uh, so Mark, as who was presented earlier on, is our chair of the Shared Health and Care Analytics Board across Kent and Medway. Uh, we have a defined uh, system for integrated care, and we've got, as you may be aware, just like other areas, the 220 odd GP practices have been coalesced into 42 primary care networks, and that makes the uh, the, the 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 governance and the decision making around uh, data sharing much more systematic. So as I mentioned, we've got the data protection impact assessment, the model clauses and the technical controls in place. Uh, what we're working out now is role based, role based access controls. So for which team needs to access which sort of data and at what level in order that. So for example, in public health, we won't be, we, it's not in our best, uh, it's not uh, our interest to access identifiable data, but what we need is person level data at population level to do aggregated population surveillance outputs. Next slide, please. So, and uh, so, and in the past, what's happened is that each organization has had a particular purpose for using data and a particular legal basis or lawful basis for using it. But what we're doing is that when we come to uh, come together as joint control, we can bring all those purposes together and work together as a joint controller arrangement to uh, list those purposes together, ranging from planning for managing finances and quality, risk stratification, coordinating patient care, undertaking research, which is what Chris is particularly focused on, and then from my perspective, public health surveillance and intelligence. I think I'll stop there. And I'll probably go on to David and he can explain some of the uh, specific examples of how he's been using uh, data for analytics. Uh, and that's uh, using a, a well established methodology, which is known as R. And David's been particularly a champion around that for the last many years, uh, promoting that across Medway as well as uh, wider Kent. David. Uh, thank you, Abraham. Um, so yes, yeah, so first I should probably emphasize that R here is not the infamous R um, that's uh, going around with uh, COVID models, but it's a, a statistical programming language. Next slide, please. So yes, yeah, so R is, oh no, sorry, back. I'm back. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, so R is a statistical programming language. Um, 
and uh, like any language, it takes a little bit of time initially to get enough of the grammar and the vocabulary together. But once you do have that, you can then use it in an incredible range of, uh, of flexible ways. So as Abraham said, um, I've been using it for, for many, many years. So we started using it here in memory public health uh, you know, since 2011. And uh, more recently, we've started to uh, promote the use of R further across uh, Kent and Medway. Um, and we're hoping to build up a community of analysts using R as the primary way to do, uh, doing analysis. Next slide, please. So typically when analysts um, analyze data, uh, quite often they will use uh, Excel or something similar and they will uh, go through a number of steps. So they'll get some data, either start with a blank sheet or work spreadsheet or uh, uh, get some data in a spreadsheet and then they will manually move data around, clean things up, uh, calculate new things. And then, um, uh, uh, then it's very often uh, situations where um, that process will be repeated. So the same set of data will come along a week or a month later and a similar analysis will be performed. So they'll go through the same steps uh, and again um, the next month or the next week. So you're always going back, back to the beginning and, and um, following through uh, the same steps. Next slide, please. Typically when you use R, um, initially you'll go through the same same process of, sort of discovering data and, and working through a number of analytical steps. But this time you're doing it in code so that the next time that you need to, to repeat the process, you'll already have some code that is um, uh, ready for you to use. So you can then either save time by just reusing that code or you can spend at the time instead of writing or following that process from scratch, you can build on that process and enable it to um, enable your code to do, do more things. And then the same again uh, the next time you repeat the process. And we do find in certainly public health intelligence um, that we end up following through these similar processes repeatedly uh, many times. So taking this approach, you get a sense of uh, forward progress each time um, uh, you perform uh, your analysis. Next slide, please. Working with code and an R makes this easy. Um, also then makes it easy to create a clean separation between your data, your analysis and your outputs. So again, when you're working with Excel, it's not unusual to have your data in one sheet and then you create some pivot tables that you put into another sheet and then create some graphs and then you'll perhaps copy and paste those outputs into a Word document. So then you're just sort of stuck if you want to share your analytical approach with somebody or, or just your outputs because you've got your, your data mixed in with your analytical process and with the outputs. With R, um, you're much more likely to have a nice clean separation and yet they're also um, explicitly linked. Um, so this process then, um, oh, the way that R works then encourages and enables uh, sharing of code and approaches. Next slide please. Another very uh, extremely useful way in which R works is it has facilities for combining um, the narrative that you're working on with your analytical processes. So in this uh, little uh, example here on line 12, we have uh, just a piece of narrative, uh, uh, just a, a sentence of text. And then from lines 14 through to 20, we have a chunk of R code. And all this simply does is assign some values to some objects and then calculate, say, uh, a crude rate. And then you, if you look at line 22, you'll see there's some narrative again. But then there's this funny thing with some backtick R followed by um, something. So backtick R deaths, for example, and followed by another backtick. And what will happen is that when this is processed, that R code will be run, those uh, values will be assigned to those objects and those calculations will be performed. And then the values of those objects will be inserted into that text. Next slide, please. And this is what it looks like when it's processed and you can process the output to become in PowerPoint presentations or um, uh, HTML files for, to go on the web, or in this case, to produce a Word document. So if you look at the bottom two lines there, you see uh, the, line, the line of narrative that was just before our, our code chunk. And then you see that final line that was the, the line after the R code chunk with the 
um, the values of those objects inserted into the text and the, um, the result of the rate calculation inserted into the text. So this is a very powerful way of working and it provides a number of um, uh, benefits to, to um, those who are developing analyses. So what this means is, is that if your data becomes is updated, um, all you need to do is just run the code again and it will update your documents. You don't need to spend time um, transcribing numbers from a spreadsheet into a Word document. This reduces the risk of transcription errors as well as saving time. And also particularly importantly, it means that if somebody comes along six months later and asks you how you calculated that death rate, um, you can very quickly and easily go back to that bit of code that generated that number and know with absolute certainty how you calculate it, calculated it. And not just you, anybody in your team can do that. The way we work um, here in Medway Public Health is that um, our team of analysts all work in a single shared area and we work in a very agile manner and it's not unusual for one person to start a project uh, and then another person to take it over and a third person to finish it. Um, or we may have several of us working on the same project at the same time and we can do this without tripping over each other's feet. And because it's all written um, as our code, it's very easy for another analyst to come along and just understand the thought process involved in performing the analysis and then to, to pick up that analysis. Next slide, please. So we used R um, to work with, we have been using R to work with the data um, that we're using for responding to the, the COVID epidemic. So very early on in the epidemic, we realized that we needed to have a good understanding of what was happening with uh, deaths in Kenton Midway. Um, as one of my colleagues mentioned earlier, we had some national estimates, um, but we weren't terribly convinced by how accurate they were. So we decided to, in fact, Abraham started this, um, started this off. Um, we decided to work with our local death registrars. So in each local authority, uh, deaths have to be reported through to the death registrar in that um, local authority. So we get daily updates from the registrars in Kent and Medway um, of the deaths that have been uh, registered. So normally these deaths are entered onto a national system and then they're processed by the Office for National Statistics. Um, but they're then able to um, get these daily extracts from the system. From looking at the data, we can see that generally 50% uh, of deaths are registered within um, about six days a week and about 95% are within two weeks. So this gives us a fairly up to date um, view on the number of deaths that are happening in our area. A really important thing to note about death certificates is that the information that is entered into the system has to be written exactly as it is written on the death certificate. And apparently this is a legal requirement. So it is all entered as free text. And, and this presents for us a, a number of analytical challenges. Next slide, please. So on the death certificate, we have uh, date of birth and date of death. And the dates, of these dates can be written in any way that the person filling in the death certificate um, wants to write the date. So these are all examples that I've seen on death certificates uh, that we've been working with um, for, for the same date, the 23rd of March, 2020. So we have to write, or we've written some code, or rather wrote, written some code that is able to take each one of these expressions of a date and turn it into um, a date like the one shown in the first bullet. And the technical way we do this is using a facility within R called regular expressions. Um, regular expressions are not just a thing that R has, lots of different programming languages use them. Uh, they're an extremely powerful way of working with uh, textual data. Next slide, please. There are a number of other issues on death certificates. Um, the cause of death is not written in a consistent manner. Um, all of the cause of death information from the death certificate is uh, put into a single box. The death certificate itself uh, contains part one and part two, and then part one can be divided into part A, B, and C. And all of these are entered as, as free text. So the, the standard typical way of writing part one and part two is to use uppercase Roman numerals, um, 
but some people use uh, up, uh, use numbers one and then one one. Um, a, B and C parts can be written as a bracket or a dot or just A on its own. And uh, some causes of death can cause us problems. So for example, some people write type two diabetes with uppercase um, uh, Roman numerals, which then clashes with the uppercase Roman numerals dividing part one from part two of the death certificate. So we had so I have a lot of code that deals with these sorts of inconsistencies in the way the cause of death is um, ent uh, entered into the system. Our main analysis was uh, has been looking at COVID versus non-COVID deaths. So initially I was just looking for the word COVID uh, until I found a death certificate, death, sorry, excuse me, a death certificate where somebody had written uh, pneumonia, not COVID. So I now have to allow for that as well. The death certificate contains information on the place of residence and the place of death. And these may not be the same. And apparently the information that is entered includes the postcode. However, the extract uh, that gets taken from the system and sent on to us, um, that has the postcode removed. So I've had to go through quite a complex process to try and match every one of these deaths to um, to a postcode so that we can then link the postcode to uh, other levels of geography uh, so that we can then perform standardized geographical analysis. So even though there's not very much information in each, each record, um, there's been quite a bit of work involved in passing it and processing it uh, to, to get it into a form that we can then analyze. Um, so it's been quite a bit of effort, but it has been worth it. Next slide, please. And this is this is why it's worth it. This shows the number of deaths per week uh, across Kent and Medway. If you look at the grey circles, um, you can see the deaths per week uh, from 2015 to 2019. So you get to see on the left and on the right uh, higher numbers uh, through the winter period and then in the centre lower numbers during the summer. And then if you look at the red circles, the red points, uh, those are the number of deaths per week in 2020. And you can see up to about week 11, um, the number of deaths uh, was sort of fitting in with the, the normal pattern. And then we had our first COVID death in week 12, and then gradually then you see quite a rapid rise up to week 15, and then a fall again. Um, so we were able to track that and follow that uh, rapid increase as it was happening, or pretty much as it was happening in, uh, in Kenton Medway. The blue circles are um, non-COVID deaths. So that shows that uh, during that peak period, we also had uh, greater than expected or greater than usual number of non-COVID deaths as well. And that may be because um, the death was actually related to COVID and COVID was not uh, included on the death certificate, or it could, could be because there's something happening within the system that resulted in an increase in non-COVID deaths as well. Right now, it looks like we've the numbers of deaths have fallen back to uh, what we would expect them to be uh, this time of year. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks, Abraham. Thank you, David. I think that was a really, uh, really powerful presentation explaining how the how the use of R has helped us to so, so, uh, do surveillance on on deaths locally in Kent and Medway. I think the two key take home messages were. Uh, the 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 emphasis on data quality and completeness to actually do analysis because that's it takes a huge amount of our time to actually do analysis uh, to do the analysis if the data quality is poor and secondly the importance of data outside of the NHS that's so important for our surveillance um, and you know we should not uh, forget about that so I just want to very quickly move on to Peter's uh, presentation which is around the, the use of modeling to help us in our local COVID impacts. Uh, Peter, do you want to thank kick you, off? Abraham. Yep, thank you, Abraham. Um, so Sarah's not been able to join us today, but her job role is there and clear, and she's um, running to um, uh, address a, a deadline from NHS England at this very moment. Um, so uh, we've worked with Sarah for the last two or three years and with Abraham for a little longer um, using system dynamics modeling. If we move to the next slide, just to set that in context, pre-COVID, uh, we'd use the kid uh, to develop a whole population um, uh, cohort model, which looked at the progression of need across the population and the response um, to prevention strategies and underlying risks to, to health. 
uh, we were starting to work with with others, both in Kent and with outcomes based healthcare to uh, align that prospective modelling um, with um, the sort of up and coming population health management approaches. And we were feeding all of that into demand and capacity modelling, whether it be uh, out of hospital care or uh, capacity modelling for the hospitals themselves. And then came COVID. Um, so uh, being embedded and being part of a community uh, of, of system dynamicists in which SEER modelling is uh, bread and butter, we very quickly picked up um, uh, an existing um, SEIR model, adapted it uh, and started initially to mimic. Uh, we've heard a little bit about national modelling early in the uh, um, in the epidemic, uh, but the priority for us was to recognise with our background and our experience and our knowledge of the four different geographies within Kent and Medway, um, that actually there might be different responses to the uh, pandemic. Um, and, and that's where we sort of kicked off with the um, with the SEER modelling. So if you go to the next slide, the overall structure, um, those who are familiar, the, the, the core SEER structure there in terms of susceptible through infected, recovered, etc., with deaths, and we've built uh, in one model an integrated um, approach to the hospital pathway uh, and indeed community, primary and community service response, both in terms of um, I suppose what one might call low levels of need uh, in terms of COVID um, infected, uh, i.e. those who don't need to go to hospital, uh, but still needing primary care services uh, and also the discharge pathways from hospital, uh, which is now featuring even more strongly in terms of post COVID care uh, and the restart programme for which we're adapting and using some of the outputs of this modelling to inform. Um, the um, the model itself is, is segmented by age group. We're adding in factors such as uh, different geographies with their um, population density and, uh, and underlying demographics. So it's quite sensitive, which the next slide demonstrates. So this is an output for the four um, geographies within Kent and Medway, um, Darfur, Gratian and Swale, Swanley, Medway and Swale, West Kent and East Kent. Uh, and um, with the scale there noted at 85%, this is the different levels of um, infected or and remaining susceptible population through to the middle of May. Um, so we're updating this all the time. The model projects forward actually into 2020, 2021. Um, but this difference clearly also um, is significant in terms of preparing for any uh, either local outbreaks or uh, were it to happen a second wave. So we've got history embedded within the model now, having iterated weekly, if not more frequently, um, with real data, which has been the only real way to, to test the validity of assumptions, which in a uh, in a novel virus like this is, uh, is, is hard work at the outset. The uh, next slide um, may, not need, may not be needed for those who are familiar with the epidemics, but the, the point that I'd make here is, is that We've spent quite a bit of time using the modelling to inform um, and educate those who are planning and really to sort of try and um, improve the, the language and the precision with which we talk about the epidemic. Um, simplest example would be, you know, how big, how big and when will the peak be? Um, and of course, that depends on whether you're talking about the peak of new infections, of admissions or of deaths or of anything in between. And this slide uh, is one that we've used regularly with senior leaders um, and have updated and modified um, just to illustrate that point. Um, it also indicates that in terms of the um, surveillance that's necessary at the moment, whilst we're in a fallow period, then clearly if you can uh, identify upticks in some of those uh, elements that will peak earlier, then that will help you to forecast then um, through into the future. The forecasting we describe as, as a combination of now casting and forecasting. The now casting tends to take us with reasonable confidence, uh, literally over a number of weeks, maybe a month or so, um, in which we can give reasonable confidence. And that's important for services that, um, that, that, that can um, sort of pick up or, or reduce uh, that sort of time scale. The longer term forecasting um, is difficult and we've got a range of scenarios depending on the effectiveness of social distancing and population behaviour uh, that, that do show a possibility of subsequent waves, but also the uh, mitigating factors such as um, closing school, reclosing schools, um, lo local lockdowns and the likes, all of which play into quite a, a, a rich picture of possible futures, um, but all the time trying to survey what's happening. Uh, 
two more slides just to say uh, what what next because we're uh, at a not only in a fallow well we're in a fallow period in terms of covid but we're in a, a, a highly um busy world in in ahs at the moment um thinking about how to restart uh and thinking about the covid generated demand uh and the likes this is this is just an example a uh, very simple dynamic there on the left hand side of a model structure that says well you've you've got a flow and this this is being applied across a whole range of physical and mental health needs um, we know what the suppressed demand was during April. We know that some of that um, will resolve itself uh, or will return, some of which will return with higher complexity. And we're starting to dis dis distinguish in our modelling um, the, the difference between suppressed, returning, modified and generated demand um, against which the, the system will need to plan. The, uh, the right hand side has been superseded now, so don't take that as um, it would probably read right winter rather than autumn now in terms of the um, uh, the current forecasts uh, were there to be second waves. But you can see here how we've applied it in terms of a hospital uh, and its hospital, its bed occupancy, which um, trundled along in the low 90s in January and February, then took a huge nosedive. Um, we've got a return um, that we're starting to see and monitor. But then we've got four different futures, possible futures, which are actually the gen generated from the COVID modelling. So we've got a little suite of models. Um, the cohort model still sits behind a lot of this in terms of our intelligence of local population health needs. The COVID models specifically around the epidemic and then increasingly service level models that take outputs and feeds from both of those uh, and intelligence from, from broader. And the uh, last slide, just to indicate, uh, this is just an example um, we've all seen and, and heard a lot about the test, trace and isolate. This is how we're translating it um, and again informing local planners and sort of identifying where the gaps are. We've got a combination as well in terms of uh, the blue line is, is, is an output from our COVID model. That is a simulated output of the number of symptomatic cases that we expect to see at this stage of the epidemic, relatively low. Um, uh, that's a whole Kenton Medway, 150 or so, slightly reducing. Um, the red and the blue lines, that is the flow through the TTI service. So the red line are the positive cases sent to TTI, um, the cases completing green, and then the cumulative number of people isolating as a result of, of, of being identified as somebody who's been in close proximity, which, it, which becomes a 14-day rolling average if, uh, if everybody who says they will self-isolate does self-isolate it. So it does self-isolate um, and a message from here that we've been pushing through through the system Kent is Kent is probably testing somewhere in the region of twice the national average it is a it has a good uh, TT, uh, testing um, regime with uh, with far more than the national average and yet it is only testing about 35 percent of the population that the simulated outputs of the model suggest will be becoming symptomatic um, so it's it's a, it's been a real sort of um, what's the right word? It's it's been a real sort of insight, I suppose, in terms of um, pushing the message around um, getting tested and also being very wary uh, around local outbreaks and, and preparing the system to respond appropriately. So uh, that's a run through. I'll stop. Um, any questions? I think now for for anybody, I'll hand back to Abraham. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. That was really uh, insightful and all that, and demonstrating how we're using uh, an advanced uh, modeling, uh, advanced analytical approach, which is systems dynamics around hel helping us around with our local COVID response. Um, I'm just looking to Joe in terms of how do we actually uh, ma uh, manage the answering of questions? Should I be doing it or, or would you be doing it? Hi, yeah, I'm happy to do it if that's all right. I can have a look. Um, we had one from Christopher Weatherburn. Um, question for the Colonel team. Uh, Chris, are you OK to unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. certainly, oh, certainly Joe, uh, it's been answered, but. Um... Ah, OK, OK, <laughs> no problem. Right. Uh, okay. uh, I'll move yeah, back I... down then to, oh, sorry, to Michael Fisher. Um, had a question about disparate data sets. Um, Michael, could you uh, unmute and ask your question? Yeah, I was just wondering um, how you actually did link them together. I mean, obviously, when you do these things, generally, you need some form of common identifier. Do you use NHS numbers or do you have a sort of matching service that matches up um, 
records and data sets and tries to identify the person it refers to or, or what? Yeah, so uh, I can I can probably answer that. So the um, in the original uh, link data set that we developed in Kent, we used two uh, two approaches. One is linking at NHS number, as you said, but it was using a pseudonymization at its source approach. So the NHS numbers uh, in each data set, which were already de-identified, that means all the other identifiers stripped out. The NHS numbers were one way hashed using SHA two. 256 uh, encryption technology and then on that basis then we linked at NHS uh, using those NHS uh, pseudonymized NHS numbers but the second thing that we did because some of the data sets that we linked for example uh, fire and rescue data around safe and well visits which were which is data that's collected at household level we linked at pseudonymized UPRN or unique property reference number and that's available for every premises across the country. So uh, so we were linking at two levels. One is at person level using NHS and the second level at household level, which is unique property reference number or UPRN. OK, thanks. OK, brilliant. Um, uh, we, had a, we had one from John Williams asking about um, what the faculty faculty could do to help build the R community. Um, John, are you able to uh, unmute and ask your question? I think you're wrong, Joe. I think it's actually Jonathan. Hello, Jonathan here. Oh, apologies. Apologies. So I'm, I'm Hi, very familiar with R in the um, academic community, and that's an international unknown participant is now exiting. Hello, am I, is this coming through? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm very familiar with that. And then in the correspondence, I see lots of NHS activity. Um, where, where, where does that take place online? And where is the next webinar going to be? Ah, oh, thank you, Timothy. We've got the URL coming up there. Yeah. Um, NHSR community probably isn't great for getting to lots of people who need to know about this, as opposed to people who do it. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Okay. Uh, sorry. Shall, I, shall I chip in here just quickly before I have to go to my next meeting? Sure, sure, David. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it, it does seem to take time. So I've been banging on about R since 2011 um, to the point initially where, where I think I was irritating people. Um, but gradually people have um, started to see the benefits of it. Um, I, I think really I've convinced people by being able to deliver products in a consistent way. Um, quite often in a, in a short time frame. Um, and I think it's that it's, it's being able to deliver the product. So the decision makers want to see the products. So they don't care about how you do it. So it's being able to deliver those products and then through the products can um, make it clear that it's been possible because of our. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to go now to my, uh, to my next meeting. I think that's fine. Thank you very much, David. Uh, George, shall we crack on with the other questions? Is that okay? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, who else is there? Um, we had one from David Whiting, who I think has left, but he was asking about um, variation in the number of deaths and possible small numbers SPC charts. And so now the main focus has been looking at raw numbers for operational purposes. Um, so that, yeah, I think that's more of a comment. Um, there was one, think, yeah. Joe, so sorry, a, sorry. Yep. Uh, Joe, I had a question for Chris Farmer about joint data controllers, and I, I, I don't know whether you saw the note I made about oh, that. Oh, yeah, no, go, go ahead, Jeremy. Um, so uh, it's a great idea to have joint data controllers, and I, I agree that what we need is trust in all of these approaches so that the public um, and particularly the privacy advocates can see not only be told but can actually see that their data cannot be accessed unless there is agreement from all parties and the idea of joint data controls is a really strong one to help enforce that but it doesn't actually enforce it as i understand it it doesn't require each party to issue for example an encrypted key which then and only then allows that specific data extract to be generated across a variety of linked data sets um 
I'll pause there for a comment um, from, from Chris, if you're there. Whether I can answer it, I don't, I can make a comment, certainly. Um, I'm not an expert in joint data controller agreements. That's been developed by Alan Day. And um, I, I suppose a comment would be that all of the, the so we've got multiple layers of work from from our uh, standard population analytics to, to formal research proposals. In terms of formal research proposals, all of those will go through two, two groups, the Shared Health Analytics Board, which has representation from all institutions. Now, it doesn't go down to every single GP. Clearly, if you, if you uh, have a model where you request uh, permission for every single study from every single GP, that becomes uh, pretty untenable. Um, so there is representation at CCG level uh, and uh, from all the acute trusts and anyone else putting data in and any research proposal would be submitted to both that and the database access committee. So whilst, yes, one, one could argue that, that that a true joint data controller would go down to GP level, we've gone down to CCG level. Does that sort of answer it? Sure, thanks very much indeed. Um, so I guess that what you have is delegated authority. Um, so individual data controllers, I've forgotten the individual GPs, the data controllers, um, but they could, um, as you say, go to this, that could, their authority could be delegated to this the local CCG. But what I was saying is that in addition to, if you like, a committee vote on um, uh, a specific, perhaps you know, particularly if it's a, a challenging or risky uh, linkage, what you also need is an enforceable and auditable um, technical method, which then translates that decision by individual data controllers into a permission that the software follows. And it, it sounds a bit far-fetched, but we did actually prototype and demonstrate this about 10 years ago in Scotland at the Dundee Health Informatics Centre. There's a technique called multiple in, multi-institution linkage and anonymization. I'm just looking on PubMed, unfortunately, the paper that we we wrote uh, hasn't yet been published. I, Mark McGilchrist is the author. I've given his name in the note and he has published a number of other articles. I th I'm sure at least one of those does describe it. Um, but it's an interesting idea that essentially you associate each data controller with a, with an encrypted token and it, only if you receive all the encrypted tokens can the linkage go ahead and then incidentally the only person who can then make the linkage is the analyst so you don't end up with a position where potentially people in your data center could make the linkage illicitly if they're being put under duress for some reason, which it's all a bit far-fetched. But if what you're after, and perhaps the most important point I'm making here is that we should be using all technical means at our disposal to build a system that is not only trustworthy, but can be trusted. It can be, it's demonstrably tr uh, unbreakable with with currently available technology and, and you know thinking about all the different risk and threat scenarios which includes data center staff being put under duress to do a linkage um which they shouldn't be doing because they're being paid by a newspaper or, or something to, to I'll, I'll stop there perhaps abraham can add to that I don't, in terms of some of that the, the technical aspects oh uh, <laughs> probably not the the right expert around the tech Techy stuff, uh, digital techy stuff, and all that. I mean, I think from uh, from a from a sign up point of perspective, we have all seven large NHS provider trusts. They've all signed up in Kent, and the CCG as well. We are David and myself are pushing very vigorously for KCC, Kent County Council, and Medway Council to join in that joint controller. And uh, Alan is uh, engineering the governance arrangements for the. Uh, for the local GP practice to sign up via the primary care networks. Now, the reason why there is a lot of interest in this is because we understand the, the importance of joint control is not just for the analytics and the research side of things, but also to actually enable as a, go, as a governance arrangement for direct care as well. Uh, alongside all of this, and probably Mark hadn't mentioned it at the beginning of the presentation, that there's another big program going on in Kenton Medway, which is the Kenton Medway Care Record. 
and that also is a, 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 a necessity where you need to have a joint controller arrangement for organizations to agree a consistent approach around sharing of information I mean, and, and the documentation. I, I suppose the, the point is we, we, we've got a pretty good structure in terms of trust between organizations. In terms of the Maverick data uh, analyst, that I agree is, is a very challenging, uh, challenging environment. Um, and I, uh, I, if I could, I'll drop you a line about that um, in terms of a technical solution. That'd be great. Sure. Yes. Happy to correspond about that. Lovely. Thanks, Jeremy. Great. Uh, yes, sorry, Joe. I was just wondering, have we finished or? I, I think, think so. Well, few... Yeah, we've gone. Well, we've got. We've, I'm aware we've gone over. If anyone has any last burning questions, uh, um... one last question about the Goldacre um, TPP. I suppose, uh, what, why not adopt that approach of developing a question before amalgamating data? I suppose it. Um, we are talking about considerably more granular data than, than, than that which was used in in that study. So, thanks, Chris. Thank you. Sorry, Joe. Um, um, I think we've sort of covered most of the. Oh, sorry. There's one more question that's just come in. One last question from Alex. Um, uh, mention of data mapping. What sort of data sets being mapped, and how is it being? Sorry. I just, how is it being maintained? So, yeah, so it's a complex information asset mapping exercise in terms of building up the kernel, which is the sequel to the Kent integrated data set. So we have a program manager or a project manager that's actually doing that work and he creates, uh, he's maintaining a complex Gantt chart of the phased implementation of data linkage of various data sets, starting with the provider, the NHS provider trust data sets that itself numbers into hundreds already. Uh, and then, uh, but because of COVID, we are accelerating also the mobilization of primary care data, which is already being sourced for the shared care record, which I mentioned earlier on. And we will create a pipeline for that or a conduit for that to be linked to the other data sets for analytic purposes. I hope that answers the question. Excellent. Thank you, George. Uh, Apron, sorry. That's brilliant. We can, um, yeah. If the panel are happy to, we can we can take any any questions by email afterwards as well, and, and can try and try and get back to you. Um, so I think that might, yeah, that would be a good point to 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 stop. Um, thank you to all the panel. Uh, this is this is going to be recorded as well, so it will be available to watch afterwards. Um, thank you to Abraham for sharing. Um, do you have any last words, Abraham? No, uh, thank you very much to all my fellow presenters and all that who, who've taken the valuable time to 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 present, uh, considering that we are all very, very busy with the local emergency response for COVID-19. Uh, I hope this was a useful presentation. I think there's uh, there's still a lot more uh, stuff that we can present, but obviously we're, we were pressed for time. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.